Guys, we're on a, on a roll. We, uh, we've had a few um, other things interspersed into our particular theme. But let me remind you of what we've been doing over the course of the last few weeks. We've embarked upon a, a series of sermons, and it sometimes almost want to apologize. It almost seems like a life school lesson, but it is a sermon about this one thing. That's what we've called it, because we're convinced that in every area of your life, there is one thing that if you do it, it will make some things unnecessary or other things easier to do. It's all about that one thing. And so we've been looking at the different areas of our lives and saying, what is the one thing that if I do this one thing, a whole lot of other things will fall away, become unnecessary, or become that much easier to do? So I've written our question up on the board here so you can refer to it as I, as I talk. But the question is, what is the one thing that if you do it, will make everything else either easier or unnecessary? Now, I think it's a critical question. And we yesterday, as Jeff said, were kind of sitting in the leadership of the church saying, basically, what is the one thing that we could do to take this church to the next level? What is the one thing that we could do to impact this community? Because very often, it is just one thing. So we continue. Last time we spoke, we spoke about... The one thing I need to know. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Thank you, John. You're a good kid. Um, the, the one thing I need to know, and we spoke about the, the biblical references to the things that we need to know. If we could take those things and apply those things that we need to know into our individual lives, it could change your life if you find that one thing that you need to know. But know is the root word of a word called knowledge. Now, I have to tell you, people, that knowledge is overrated. Because knowledge on its own leads you nowhere. Probably the only place it could lead you is to pride. Because prideful people are generally people who think they know better than the next person. And so knowledge on its own is somewhat overrated. The thing that we need to talk about is not just knowledge, but we need to do what we now know. And what you do is will be determined by what you know, but it is the next step. So today I'd like to talk about some of the things that you may need to do in order to find your next step in the various areas of your, your life. I want to read to you, if you will turn to it, a passage that is a, a beautiful Old Testament story. And you'll find it in the book of Exodus, and it's chapter 15. And I'd like to read from verse uh, 27. It's, it's a well-known story. Then Moses, this is Moses after he had come out of Egypt, led the children of Israel into the the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And uh, a couple of days out of, the, out of the wonder of the miracle of the open sea, this is what happened. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shut. From three, for three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. This is why they call it Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? They're kind of forgetful people. Three days earlier, God had opened the Red Sea, and, and now they're whining and they're moaning. And then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became, became sweet. There the Lord made a decree and a law for them, and there he tested them. It was just a test. But they failed the test. And he said, If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God, and then do, there's a key word, and then do what is right in his eyes. If you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. People, it's not about stuff that we know. You know, and there's some knowledgeable people out there. It's the stuff that we do with what we know that is so vitally important. Now, from a sermon point of view, if you went to preaching school, they would tell you, you know, that one of the first things you, you tend to do as a preacher, you tend to preach from Genesis to Revelation all in one sermon. You try and cover as many bases as you can in the hopes that something's going to drop. And they tell you, don't do that because that's, that's stupid. People can't absorb that much information. Well, I'm going to break that rule today. And I'm going to cover a wide range 
of things. So forgive me if you're a sermon critic today. I fail before I start. But I, I, want, I want to spread myself quite broad by taking you to a number of things that if you do these things, if you could find this one thing to do, it could change the entire way that you live your life. And so we get to look at a whole bunch of things that we can do. And I have a long list here, and I'm, I'm not going to keep you that long, but I, I do want to do this exercise. The first thing that I would like to suggest that you need to do, you'll find the example of this in John chapter 2, and it's a simply do what he tells you to do. Number one, do what he tells you to do. Now, I, I love telling the story, and some of you will have heard my story about a time when I, I found myself in New York, and it was a cold day, it was snowing, and it was really quiet, and I was by myself walking through the streets of New York, and it was getting dark, in fact, it was already dark, and I was cold, and I, I saw wedged between two of these high-rise buildings a, a little church, and the lights of the church were on. So I walked into this little church, and it looked really cozy and warm, so I sat down sort of halfway back in there and warmed myself, and it was just a beautiful little place to sit and contemplate. After a few minutes of sitting there, the priest of the church walked in, and he was doing some stuff up at the altar. He took no notice of me sitting there, and there I was with my big jacket and my beanie over my head. It was freezing cold, and he took no notice, and then within a few minutes of him arriving, the doors opened, and in came a whole bunch of very, very excited people. I thought I was in a charismatic movement here. Anyway, all these excited people dressed up to the nines, and I realized I was finding myself in the middle of an Italian wedding. <laughs> and, 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 and this was so exciting. And these women were going off, and they were so excited about the wedding, and it was, it was just a, a really cool vibe. And then the bride arrived, and then the groom arrived, and I sat in the midst of all this, and I just joined in the wedding. And I, I watched this, the whole wedding. Anyway, at a particular point after they'd done the vows, the minister stood up, to preach his sermon to these kids. Now, I do a lot of weddings, so I thought this should be quite good. Let me see how somebody else does it. So I listened to this man say something incredibly profound. He stood in front of these two kids, and he said to these two young people, he says, young people, I know that you have great expectations for a great marriage. I know that you have great intentions to make this marriage work. I have one thing, just one thing, there's our theme, that you need to do in order to make this marriage what God wants it to be. And he turned to John chapter 2, and he read the story of the wedding at Cana of Galilee. And he said to this, after telling the story of Jesus turning the water into wine, and everything that happened prior to that, there was no wine at the wedding. Jesus' mom Mary came to Jesus and said, Jesus, you need to help these people. There's no wine. And Jesus said, Mom, my time has not yet come. And she said, well, these people need help. Please, can you help them? And she, then she turned to the servants in the house, and she simply said to them, just do what he tells you to do. And this minister said to these young people, he says, if you could just do that, you will be guaranteed success in this marriage. Just that one thing will make your marriage meaningful and full of purpose for the rest of your days. Just do what Jesus tells you to do. And I sat there, and I thought, is it that simple? Is it that simple? Apparently it is. If you just do what Jesus tells you to do, it is that simple. So it was a great wedding. And at the end of the wedding, I had all these thoughts going through my mind, and they, they incorporated me into the big group. It was so much fun. Nobody asked, who the heck are you? So I joined in the group, and I was in the photographs as they took them. <laughs> <laughs> standing on the steps of this church uh, there with my beanie and my jacket on and, and, and so they must one day we'll look at these wedding photographs and say hey, who the heck is that guy <laughs> but it was a lot of fun but the lesson I learned that day was a profound one this one thing the first thing just do what Jesus would tell you to do now we've got to ask the question Jesus tell you to do well there's three things there's three areas that I think Jesus would want you to do stuff in the first one is in the area of how you function. How you function. You see, you cannot function well where you're carrying junk around with you. You cannot function well as a human being. Never mind, as a Christian human being, you'll never function well while you're carrying unforgiveness around with you or while you're carrying the need to be forgiven around with you. That's why I love it. In Genesis 32, we have the story of Jacob and Esau. 
after Jacob had ripped Esau off and run with his birthright, and he had conned him. Esau was after him with vengeance in his eyes. And Jacob spent the rest of his days, or all of those days, running away from his brother until one day he says, I can't function like this anymore. My functionality has died. I, I'm, I'm becoming di- dysfunctional. I can't think straight because of, of this baggage of unforgiveness or not being forgiven. I need to go and see my brother. Ha, <laughs> ha. This one thing. When he did that one thing, he organized the meeting with his brother. And after that meeting, he said, why did I not do this earlier? Why did I walk through all those years of dysfunctional thinking and baggage and sleepless nights and ulcers and ill health and and horrible things about, why did I do that? If I'd just done that one thing, it would have helped me to function that much better as a human being. People, that's the law of the jungle, man. And you can't carry that kind of stuff. So whatever it is, whether it's forgiveness or need for unfor- or need for forgiveness, whatever it is, for goodness sake, do that one thing. The next area that Jesus will tell you to do will probably have something to do with the area of faith. Function first, faith second. I, I never see God doing anything without, in the Scriptures without somebody igniting God's power. It's always a small thing. God will never tell you to do something you can't do. He will only tell you to do what you can do. But when you do what you can do, God does the rest. Moses, lift the stick. Yes, I can lift the stick. David, throw the stone. Yes, I can throw the stone. And whenever we activate God's action, it's generally in Scripture through some simple act. So many examples. But I've chosen this one. Matthew 12 is a great story of, of the man who had the withered arm. And Jesus comes to the temple that day, and the Pharisees are giving him a hard time, wanting to see if he's going to heal on the Sabbath day and do good on the Sabbath. And he sees the man. He knows what the test is that that he's coming up against. So he shouts to this man. He said, man, with a withered arm, stretch out your arm. (laughs) And the man, I'm trying to hide it. I've got it under a blanket here. Why would I want to stretch it out? And Jesus is saying, if you stretch your arm out, I can heal you. If you keep your your arm hidden and if you don't stretch it out, there's no healing for you, pal. And the man throws his garment off and he stretches out as best he can his withered hand. And with that simple act of faith, the man's hand and arm was healed. What's the one thing that God's asking you to do as a step? of faith. Faith is that sixth sense that doesn't always make sense. That's why it's called faith. And we live by faith. And you may want God to do a whole bunch of stuff in your life, but without you taking that simple step of faith, they will, I have to tell you, very unlikely that God's going to do anything for you. The next thing that you may have to do is uh, do whatever he tells you. You've got to function better. You've got to have a, a step of faith. But you've also got to forget. Forgetfulness. That's a great gift. You've got to forget certain stuff in order for us to move forward. Philippians 3 verse 12. Paul says this. That's beautiful. He says, one thing. He says, one thing. Just one thing I do. He says, forgetting what is behind And straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize. Forgetting what is behind. People, you can't fix it. If you could fix it, then please go back there. But nobody can fix your past. All you can do is damage control around it. But people will live in the past, and even sometimes they live in the good of the past. And when you hear testimonies of people stand up, it's a testament came from 25, 30 years ago. And they're still living back there, whether it be good or bad. People, there comes a time where we have to forget the past in order to move forward in our Christian experience. Now, I'm not belittling for a moment the hurt that you may have experienced, the disillusionment that had been there. I'm sure it's been huge. But all I know is that you can't fix it. If you want to keep going back, you said this and you did that, why did you go there? How come this? You're never going to fix this thing because you can't rewind it. All you can do is delete it. And move forward. There's a a tool that we use, and I'll play Dr. Phil for a moment. And I've used this tool before. where We we use it a lot with with kids. And I I think I've mentioned it to you before some years back. 
about teaching kids how to, how to manage their minds, maybe you need to do this exercise. We talked to kids about visualizing a huge room. We said to a kid, I want you to visualize the biggest room that you possibly can. And then once you've got that big room, the kids say, yeah, Uncle Trevor, I've got a big room in my mind. I said, okay, pal, what I want you to do is fill that room with filing cabinets. You know those filing cabinets? I'll show him or her what it is. I suppose you to fill this room with filing cabinets from back wall to front wall to side wall to side wall. The whole thing full of filing cabinets. Have you done that? Yeah, Uncle Trevor, I can see a big room, filing cabinets. I've got it. Then I'll say to him, in those filing cabinets is everything that has ever happened to you in your life. Every time you failed, it's in one of those filing cabinets. Every time you did good, that memory is in one of those filing cabinets. Every time somebody said something, and every time, any time you said something, is somewhere in those filing cabinets. It's there somewhere. The challenge is that you can only reach one row of the filing cabinets, the one row that is in the front. So I'll say to the kid, what is the filing cabinet that you visit the most every day? Which is the filing cabinet that has the things that you remember most of all? And generally, the front row is full of all our failures. The front row of cabinets that we have easiest access to is the ones that's got all the things that have failed and the things that people have done and the horrible things that people have said. And I'll say to the kid, these things happened a long time ago. All we have to do is revise how your filing cabinet or your filing room is set up. Can we move those filing cabinets back one row? And let's, when we move something back, we have to move something forward to make room for it. Let's bring something better into this thing. This could save a relationship if you do this. If you visualize how that you can take, and we so have this morbid attraction as people. We are morbidly attracted to the dumb, stupid, horrible things that we are to the good and the glorious things. That's why Jesus says, think on these things. Think on that which is good and pure and holy and right. Think on those things. Bring those filing cabinets to the front of your mind and visit those at 3 o'clock in the morning instead of the failures and the disgruntledness and the disappointment with people around you. Bring those to the front. And when you start visiting those filing cabinets, watch what happens when you begin to reprogram your mind. That's good. You function a whole bunch better. Faith becomes more of a possibility as you begin to forget. Now, I know that we're not forgetting in a sense that we don't remember, but I'm suggesting that it's not forgetfulness in memory, but it's forgetfulness in meditation. That's the key. You know, you'll never forget some of those things, will you? Who's going to forget a, a, an abuse? You're not going to forget that, but that's the focus. is not just forgetting in your memory. You'll never do that. But in your meditation, what do you think about at 12 o'clock at night or when you can't sleep or during the course of the day? When you meditate upon those things, they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And every time you tell that story, it gets bigger. Have you noticed that? It's like a war story. Every time you tell a story of what's bad thing is happening, it gets bigger. And by the time you've told the story 25 times, it's an enormous thing. We need, we need to learn to minimize our problems. Or our challenges, not maximize them and make them bigger. And the more we make them bigger, the more we talk about them, the more we, and I'm not saying we don't talk about them, we do, but we do it under control. But the more we speak about things, it's like a war story, it just gets bigger. First, it's me against five, eh? Yeah. And then I said, the next time I tell a story, you know what? Hey, man, it was actually 10. It was me against 10. By the time I've told the story, I'm flipping Rambo, you know? It's me against 5,000. And, and you know the tragedy is? That the more you tell the story, the tragedy is you actually begin to believe your own lie. That's the truth. So this reprogramming of our mind is vitally, vitally important. We've got to learn people to forget. God is a forgetful God. Isaiah 43 verse 25, he says this, I blot out your transgressions, and I, God, who has a perfect memory, I remember them no more. As a believer, you'll never be held to account for sin when you stand before God one day because you'll say, God, oh, I'm so sorry I did that thing. And I'll say, what thing? I don't remember anymore. What did you do? Did you remind me? What did you do? Oh, you didn't, you didn't really do that. God's going to say, and you say, well, Lord, I did. God said, well, I forgot that because he forgets perfectly. Maybe we could do a bit of that. The second thing that you're going to do is you're going to do what he tells you to do. And then the next thing you're going to do you need to do is to do 
do what is right. Oh, this is not brain surgery, people. Just do what's right. <laughs> we face the challenges in business, and I take my hat off to you businessmen who operate with integrity, and you do what is right. Not just convenient or comfortable, but you learn what it means to do what is right. Genesis 4, God has a conversation with a man called Cain. And Cain is really angry because his brother Abel's offering has been accepted by God. And God sees Cain's anger and he comes to Cain and he says, Cain, why are you so angry? If you do, if you do, if you do what is right, you will, not, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Sin desires to have you, but you must master it. God's not going to master your sin for you, people. He will forgive your sin, but you have to master your own sin. You have to do what is right. He's not going to do that for you. You can't pray, Lord, help me to do right. God says, sorry, God, I'll be with that. That's your deal. You have to do what is right. And you look through the scripture, and you see people who do this. You see Daniel. I made a great guy. Daniel, Daniel did what was right when he, he rejected the food that he'd rejected and he prayed when he was told he couldn't pray. Daniel did what was right. Pontius Pilate did not do what was right because prevailing wisdom of the people and the public opinion was too important for him. Zacchaeus did what was right. And when he came to Jesus, he paid back four times what he had ripped off the people. Judas did not do what was right. And he messed up. But I had a friend some years back, and he was a great friend, and uh, he died. He was, he was an elderly man, and he was a real mentor to me in my younger days. And this man died, and I had a part in his funeral. And during the funeral time, we have these eulogies, and people come forward and speak. And a man came to the front who I did not know. This man took the microphone, and he told a story about my, my friend. And he said, you know this guy that we've come to remember today? He intrigued us. Because he lived in Peter Maritzburg once, and there was a break-in in his house. And that guy came in and stole something that was very precious to him. One day he's driving down the road, and he sees a young man, and he knows that this is the young man who's broken into his house. So he stops. This man's looking for a lift. And he picks up the young guy. The young guy gets to the car, and he realizes, this is the man I stole that thing from. Now, my man knew this. He knew who he was. So he said to this young man, he says, young man, I know that you broke into my house and you stole this thing. It was a theodolite. You stole this theodolite from me. It's an old theodolite. It's not worth anything to anybody. You know what, young man, I'd really love to have that theodolite back. You could keep the rest of the stuff that you, 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 the insurance has paid me out for the whole thing. The insurance paid him for everything. Anyway, kid got out the car, still in denial. Until a couple of days later, he was walking past his house, and he noticed a plastic packet in the drain. So he went across the drain, and he pulled out the plastic packet, and he took out his theodolite. There it was. This kid couldn't sell it, but it was a real emotional value connection to him. He was overjoyed. You know what the first thing he did? He did what was right. He wrote a check back to the insurance company for the value that they had put on the theodolite. Now, who does that? Who does that? And this, this insurance man who told this story was in tears as he said, we've never seen that before. No one's ever paid the insurance company back when they've retrieved their goods, but this man did what was right. People, nobody, saw, not often people said, he never told me the story. I had to wait for his funeral to find out how right he had done. And so it was a great Great. So people, when you face some of the challenges of life, you know, just ask yourself the question, can I do what is right? Next thing we have got to do, Deuteronomy 6.18 leads us to the next thing that we have to do. Deuteronomy says this, do what is right and good. There's a connection between doing what is right and doing what is good. Now, I want to define the, the difference. You know, we often speak in the Bible about the goodness of God, and God says, be good. You'll never be good without Jesus. You do know that. But there's an element of goodness. Goodness is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, we're hooked on 
Everybody in our generation wants to be great. And so we want to go from good to great. I don't want to knock what Jim Collins says. I think some great stuff there. But the Bible never affirms too much greatness. The Bible affirms goodness. Good is good enough in Jesus' eyes if you know what good means. Now, good is great to Jesus, but you've got to know what the difference is. You see, when we become Christians, when we commit our lives to Christ and He takes away our sin, in essence, we become good in His eyes. We become perfect in His eyes because our sin, the imperfection and the trashing that it has done of our lives is no longer there and we have become good in God's eyes. But the reason that you have become good people is so that you can do good. <laughs> I remember saying to you a while back, you know when parents leave their kids at home, what's the last words they say to their kids? Be good. Uh, be good. And what they're really saying is, just don't do anything naughty. That's what they're really saying. They're not expecting the kid to, you know, to, to come home, back from the, house, the visit and had the house painted and the lawn cut. That wouldn't be good. But they're not saying that. They're just saying to the kid, just be good, meaning don't do anything that is wrong. And so our Christian lives has become, in the main, a sin management thing. If I can just manage my sin better, I will be better and I will be a good person. That's rubbish. I'll manage your sin. This is what we're here to do. God forgives sin. And when he says be good, he's talking about doing good. That's why he talks about the beauty of, of the stories of the, what Samaritan? The good Samaritan. Not the great Samaritan, as some would want him to be. He was just the, the good Samaritan. And he did good. Luke chapter 10. And then at the end of the story of the good Samaritan, Jesus is having this conversation with a bunch of people saying, who is my neighbor? And he asked them, who do you think your neighbor is? And they say, well, the one who did good to the other guy in the gutter. And Jesus said, hey, go and do likewise. People, don't just do what is right. Do what is good. And I've got to tell you, in our world where we live, there's a stack of opportunity to do that. Just do what is good. In 2 Timothy 25, 21, you know the story well. We refer often to the parable of the king and the, and the stewards. The king gave the stewards some stuff and said, go and invest this stuff so when I come back, you can give that stuff back to me with my return. And so the king goes away, comes back, day of accounting comes. Two of them did really well, and they did good with that, what the king had given them. But the one did nothing and the king was very, very angry with them. But to the ones who did well, he says this, well done, what? Good. Not great. You don't save the world. Just a good man. Good and faithful servant. There's some connection between goodness and faithfulness. God's not asking you to be great. In his eyes, you already are. He thinks you're awesome. But he's just saying... Just be good and do good. The next one is very similar, to do what is good. In Micah chapter 6, verse 8, you knew this was coming. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. And how do you show what is good? You do justly, you love mercy, and you walk humbly. If you want to know what it means to do good, then you need to do justly. Now notice he doesn't say do justice. Let God do justice. He's the only one who's entitled to do justice one day. But do justly. That's why I applaud in many ways our legal system. Because I think there's a thing there where they call extenuating circumstances. Where if a man is put up in court, and I'm glad Johannes here to tell me if I'm wrong on this. You know, that a man or a woman will be put in the dock and will be found to whether they're, they're guilty or whether they're, they're innocent. If they're guilty, the first thing they do is say, let's look at the extenuating circumstances in order to understand why he did what he did before we pass sentence. I remember some years back, we were in the chapel hall. We had a men's evening. And there were a whole bunch of men there. And it had happened at a time where there'd been a terrible tragedy in our community and a person in, just out of town here had been murdered by a 16-year-old young man. 
And the community was crying for blood. The community was crying for revenge. Their friend, their partner had been killed and they wanted an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Anyway, that night, it happened that the prosecutor of that young 16-year-old kid happened to be at that men's meeting. Anyway, the conversation turned to this thing. And I remember so clearly this prosecutor just stopping everybody and saying, guys, can I speak for a moment? And everybody was verbalizing their, 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 you know, their strong feelings about death sentences and all this kind of stuff. And this prosecutor said, hey, have any of you met this young man? And I'm thinking, no, don't say that because now I'm feeling bad. I know where you're going with this. He said, I'm prosecuting this case. I've met that young man. Let me tell you his story. This young man was rejected as a child. This young man had not had a decent education. He'd been abused and rejected by society, by his community. And I'm not condoning what he did at all. Don't get me wrong. But I am beginning to understand a little bit of the person. You see, the difference between doing justice and doing justly is found in understanding. Understanding. We jump to conclusions so fast. When Jesus had that young woman that was thrown, caught in adultery, in front of him. And they said, judge him, Jesus. Give justice here according to the law. This woman has been caught in this act. Jesus, and Jesus says, well, what does the law say? <laughs> and they said, the law says that she should die. And Jesus said, well, go and kill her. If that's what the law says, then you better stone her. But before you do that, guys, before you do that, maybe let he who is perfect amongst you throw the first stone. And the men began to look and say, Yo, now I'm beginning to understand. Let me understand a little bit more about this woman. Why did she end up like this? It's all about beginning to understand. I have to tell you people, God does the same thing for us because He understands us. God is not wanting to condemn us because He understands us. God extends, understands the accentuating circumstances that exist in your life simply because you're a human being. We are prone to sin. Anybody here want to cast a stone? I'm not throwing any stones until I'm perfect. And I'm so imperfect, I'm not going to throw stones at anybody. Because I just know, and I know that God knows, that I know, that He knows, that I know that He understands. He understands that. We have this picture of God just like a policeman waiting to get us and judge us and throw us in jail. He's not like that, people. God wants you to know how much He really loves you. And there is nothing that you have done by way of sin that he has not seen before. There's nothing that you have done by way of sin that he has not forgiven before. He loves you. He's not even forgetful, is God, but he's graciously understanding. And he turns justice into doing justly for that one truth. Do not be fooled, though. There will come a day of reckoning for those who have messed up your lives for those who have abused children and for those who have done, there will come a day of reckoning, but it won't be you doing the reckoning. It will be God who will do that. And we will trust Him with the issues of justice. Can I do just one more? Let's do this one. Colossians 3 verse 17 says this, Whatever you do, Now we've reversed it. Whatever you do, do to the glory of God, whether word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. Now whatever is the key word here. Whatever means whatever. <laughs> whatever you like to do, do it to the glory of God. Whatever you need to do, do it to the glory of God. We all need to work. Do that to the glory of us. Stop whining and moaning about your boss. Just do your job to the glory of God and watch what happens. Whatever you love doing, whatever you dream to do, whatever you're gifted to do, whatever you commanded to do, do it all to the glory of God, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, 
I, I think for us, I refer back to the first sermon we preached on this. For many of us, we have compartmentalized our lives. And we have a spiritual compartment. We have a compartment that we go to when we're at work. We have a compartment in our minds that only you and I or you go to, that no one else actually goes to. We have a social compartment. And, and very often, we end up with these eccentric Christians. Remember this? Where they have a different center to every area of their lives. And they end up with a, a chamos. American ladies, that means a mess. Okay? A mess is chamos. I love that word. Chamos. It's a good, it's the only Afrikaans word I know. So, um, you end up with this eccentric Christian experience because every area of your life has got a different center. A good Christian person is one who has the same center, but everything, everything, everything revolves around the same center. That's concentric circles. And when we secularize our life, we have a secular box and we have a spiritual box. I have to tell you, people, you're in trouble before you start. You're going to be dysfunctional. You're going to become a, a, a schizophrenic Christian. Which box am I in now? You know, it depends on my, well, where am I now? Where, what box should I be in? You, know, you become terribly eccentric as a Christian. But concentric Christianity has a one center deal. This one thing. And when your life is centered around that, then everything else either becomes irrelevant or easier to do. Have you got it, people? There is one more. <laughs> we'll just see that. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19, Jesus says this. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this. The question we have to ask is, what is this? Well, the this is determined by the context of Jesus saying it. Do this. He was at the Last Supper with his disciples. And he had washed their feet. They had eaten the meal and then Jesus said, I want you to do what we have done tonight in remembrance of me. That's the this in this situation. Well, we're going to give you an opportunity to do this in remembrance of him right now. And we're going to close this section of our, of our sermon series with doing this that Jesus told us to do. In what? In remembrance of him. I don't know if you've been watching TV this last week, that you would have seen so many of the channel, channels are remembering the death of Lady Di. Every second channel you turn on is because it's 20 years since her death. So everybody's gone back to remember the death of this princess. That's 20 years ago. Well, today we want to go back some 2,000 years to remember the death of our king. That's what this is about. To remember the sacrifice that he paid. To remember that the bread or the wafers that we take is just a symbol of his broken body. And that the cup that we will drink of is just a symbol of his shed blood. But there's something mystical about this. I don't understand it. I wish I could explain. But I can't. There are no words to explain the mystery of communion. That's why we warn to take it so seriously. Do not come to this table lightly. Do not come to this table frivolously. Or stupidly. You come to this table with a sense of, of sobriety and a sense of remembering and a sense of reflection at all that God has done on your behalf. So we're going to do this in remembrance of Him. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for the beauty of what your Word teaches us. Thank you that you make it clear on how we should live our lives. So we can just find that one thing, and not just know it, because knowledge is, is overrated, but to know and to do what we know would just turn our lives around. Father, I pray that we learn what it means to, to do what is right, and to do what is good, and to do justly, and to do whatever we do to the honor and the glory of your name. But right now, Lord, we want to forget all of that stuff. And we want to do this in remembrance of you. You are so good to us. And we remember as you commanded us that fateful night, that awful night, but an awesome night. When you met with your disciples and you were anxious, your death was only a few hours away and these disciples were confused. And you ate your last meal with them. 
And then you gave them this most incredible picture of what you were doing. They didn't understand it then. We only understand it now. And we can only understand in part what this is all about. Because it's a mystery. And you took that bread and you broke it. Told them, eat this stuff. Picture my broken body. And you gave them the cup and said, drink this. In remembrance of me. People, as we take our communion right now, the team are just going to sing. You're invited to sing with them. But once you take this opportunity to not just remember, but to reflect on all that God has done, and then to conclude your reflection with a reaffirmation of your commitment to Jesus. I wish I could do it for you. I can't. But I invite you to do it right now as we share this communion time together.